But once again, good morning, everyone. I have a question for you before we uh, dive into our lesson for today. Question is, have you ever had a hard time living the faith that you claim to have? So we, we have a faith, and is it, is it hard to actually live that out fully and completely in everyday life? Let's take a look at the word Christian for a moment. Now, the word Christian is a combination of the word Christ with the suffix I-A-N, E-N, Christ, E-N, Christian. Now, what does that suffix mean? It means one from, or belonging to, or relating to, or like, whenever you have that suffix I-A-N at the end of a word. So this is more than just a simple word to describe the member of a particular religion. Um, for example, if you're Canadian, uh, you have the combination of Canada and that suffix, once again, of I-A-N. It means, and it means something when you leave Canada. It might not mean a whole lot necessarily when we're in Canada, but when you leave Can Canada, it certainly means something for those who travel. It means that when you go somewhere as a Canadian, you go uh, having a reputation, a uh, character, and you're a representative of the nation. Uh, I remember my wife, Ruthia, telling me about backpacking back in the, I guess it was the, the 90s. And you'd have, and still as today, uh, backpackers would go across Europe and they would wear, uh, the Canadian ones would wear on their backpacks often a, uh, a Canadian flag. Now, why? Because it was known that Canadians were polite, friendly, humble, and they just sort of got along with people. So people liked Canadian backpackers. And she even told me that there were Americans that from time to time would put a Canadian flag on their backpacks uh, so they would be treated the same way because they didn't have the same reputation internationally. So the, the suffix at the end of the word Christ, this means something. It means that you belong to Christ, that you're a representative of Christ. And to our early definition of that suffix, you are one with Christ. You belong to Christ. You're related to Christ. You are to be like Christ. And to contribute to the reputation of Jesus in the world wherever we go. Whenever we leave, outside of our doors or even inside our homes. Now, in its original context, the word Christian means little Christ, which makes sense. It's a term, as I understand it, was thrust on followers of Jesus uh, in a derogatory way. Like, you want to be like that poor rabbi who died on the cross? Sure, go right ahead. But the early church, once they heard that, they said, great, not only are we following what Jesus had prophesied, that you would suffer for bearing the name of Christ by taking mocks and, and insults, but you actually get to embrace him as being a little Christ in the world. This was adopted immediately. So one of the best places in all of scripture to turn in the Bible that lays out what it means to be a little Christ, to have the character of the heart of Jesus, is in chapter 5 of the biblical letter of Galatians. And what does it say? It says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those, and here it is, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So again, those who belong to Christ Jesus will emulate these characteristics of love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, it is at this point where little Christs, Christians, it can get very, very challenging to really practice the faith that we proclaim Sunday by Sunday, to truly emulate the heart of Jesus Christ as his ambassadors, as citizens, as members of his family, in word and in deed, in what we say and what we do, to be little Christs. And the passage we are looking at today is from Matthew's Gospel, this is or Testimony of Jesus in chapter 21. And there's a lesson here for us about what it means to turn our lives over to that which is the most important thing in all of life. Actually, 
the most important person in all of life. And to hear the sometimes difficult and challenging ways that the God of love will use to get through to us so that we can have the potential and the possibility, the power, to emulate the very character of Jesus Christ. So in our passage, Jesus has just entered the last week of his earthly life, his earthly ministry. And everything on this week has a new, resolute, and public, public purpose. And everything he did was full of deliberate symbolism about his nature as the king of Israel, a king of an upside-down kingdom where the first is last and the last is first, where the humble and meek things of the world triumph over power and ambition, where the greatest of all is the servant of all, where the road to life is through death, the upside-down kingdom. Now, the ones who struggled with the most and the ones who struggled with Jesus the most by far were, sadly, the religious leaders of the day. Scribes, who were the biblical scholars, and the chief priests. This is the religious establishment. Now, these leaders could not live the faith they claimed to have. They could not live that faith, even when the author of faith stood right in front of them. Now, why is this? Jesus was doing nothing but good. There were miraculous signs were clear and were obviously bringing transformation to people's lives. That he was healing people, he was feeding people, he was turning people away from darkness and evil in their own hearts and lives and back towards God. This was plain for everybody to see, including these religious leaders. Uh, I mean, what, what could be wrong with that? But what Jesus was doing was upsetting their sense of authority, their command of the people, and the way things went in Israel. They were so consumed by their attachment to reputation and power and their control over their own life that their jealousy made them blind to the fact that God stood right in front of them, calling them out, trying to reach them. So in our passage for today from verses 23 to 32, Jesus makes two attempts to reach them. The third we're going to hear about next week, so be sure to come back and join us for that. So these religious leaders were, were, were not concerned, firstly, about the good that Jesus was doing. They were only concerned, again, about the authority by which he was doing it. It was about authority. This was what was most important to them. Their authority versus his authority. Tell us, they say, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Again, they have no idea that Jesus, who is the master physician of the human soul, has completely drawn out their deepest sickness of the soul to the surface. They have named it themselves. It's about authority. Now it's up to them to deal with it. So in a true rabbinic style of teaching, Jesus answered their question with another question. Now I don't know about you, but if I ever do that, all I can see is my wife's face and the conversation not going my way if I answer a question with a question. But Jesus, he can do it. He's opening a door for transformation. Now, do these leaders recognize what's going on? Verse 24, Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? Seems like a very simple question. And they argued with one another. So it's not simple to them. It goes on, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. So what's going on here? The leaders have sensed a trap, and they spend time huddled together to try and get out of this trap. Because John the Baptist, of which Jesus was asking them about, taught about the kingdom of God. He drew thousands of people out to him in the wilderness, calling people to turn from their own sense of authority and power and independence and turn back to God. To choose life, to choose the author of life, to choose purpose, to repent. Which means to turn and have a new mind about things. These leaders knew all of this, but they didn't trust John either. Is too much of a threat. 
on the one hand, is a threat to their own power and autonomy, their own authority. And on the other hand, they're afraid of losing their reputation by admitting that they thought that John was a troublemaker. So they deny to answer Jesus' basic question. And what they really did, what they really did was turn from the kind but hard opportunity to turn away from their pride and back to God that Jesus was offering them. And again, with Jesus being God's own son standing right before them. And no amount of biblical training, not even their role to be teachers of God's ways to God's people, none of it competes against the human heart which is bent on itself and its own sense of authority. Well, Jesus doesn't leave them there. He tries again. Another offer to call them out of themselves by teaching them a parable. Jesus says in verse 28, What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and he went. The father went to the second son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said the first. There's no way to not answer that, that way. So Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John, John the Baptist, came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes, they did believe him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds. You did not repent and believe him. So we have two sons. The one at first who says, forget it, I'm not doing the will of my father, I'm going to do my own thing. But then he changed his mind, which is another word for repent. He turned away from his own will and back to the will of his loving father who has authority. And the second, who has the right tone of voice, uses the right words. He says very politely, I go, sir, a phrase of deference and respect. But then he decides to do things his own way. So which does the will? The most outcast of society, the ones who on the surface look morally hopeless, are turning back to God. But the upstanding by reputation do not. Again, the answer is clear. These religious leaders speak the right way. They have knowledge at their fingertips about the Bible and the ways of God. But in all their status and all their rank and all their personal resources, their hearts, they decide in the end to value their own authority over the authority of their God. And they have no idea. They have no idea that the same God in the person of Jesus Christ, standing right before them, has done them a profound favor, giving them every opportunity to see their folly. Now, the Old Testament scriptures of which these religious leaders would likely have memorized, likely have memorized, if they had a turn to the wisdom literature that we find in the book of Proverbs, you would see an indictment against themselves. This is from Proverbs chapter 9, verses 7 and 8. Whoever corrects a mocker invites insults. Whoever rebukes the wicked incurs abuse. Do not rebuke mockers or they will hate you. Rebuke the wise, rebuke the wise and they will love you. This is from Chapter 12, verse 15. Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to advice. Now, you know, I have to admit that as much as these religious leaders bother me, I mean, their character is left open for all to see, and their stubborn refusal to acknowledge the beauty and authority of Jesus that this, I have to be very, very careful that this narrative is not here to throw stones at them as though I have no part in this story. And I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul's words to the Romans in chapter 2 of his letter, and this is what he says. So when you, a mere human, pass judgment on them, as people that do wrong, you, a mere human, that shows, shows pass, passes judgment on them and yet do the same things do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Here we see 
the kindness and love of Jesus, trying to lead them into repentance. And who am I to judge when the very same things happen in my own hearts? The God who saves humankind, the lover of souls, is compassionate, infinitely patient, kind and merciful. All these things are true and more. However, he is also fiercely real. He's an exposure of the truth. He's a refining fire of holiness. He's the one who accepts us as we are, but he promises never to leave us there. And when he calls us out in the ways in which he did to these religious leaders, he doesn't do it to shame us or to harm us, but to refine us and to hold us up to the light because as Christians, as little Christs, we are also people of the light. Jesus, he doesn't want just part of our lives. He wants all of us because he loves us and knows what's best for us. So the example that we have here with the religious leaders. Well, if we are followers of Jesus, we have also been called out by him in the very same way from time to time. Now, why does he do that? Because we are human and we get bent on our own ways with our own sense of authority and our own sense of power. We judge things incorrectly, like these religious leaders, because we're more concerned with our own ideas of what is right, with preserving our own reputation and our own control of our own lives. Now, have you ever been called out by someone? Here's a good test for our sense of authority and how it can be so important to us. Have you ever been called out by someone at the wrong time, in the wrong way, and our primary reaction was embarrassment? or contempt, or outrage, and we miss the glaring fact that our pride has been hurt more than anything else. We push back against that person for not causing a wound, but exposing a wound. I want to end today with just a word about the hope of Jesus Christ. And we take a look at these religious leaders and it's easy to, to judge. It's easy for uh, that, that sense of outrage to be stirred, that people could treat Jesus in the way that these men did, even though it was so clear he was doing such wonderful things for the world. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. So this is very important. What he didn't say was, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God instead of you, but ahead of you. So there is still hope as long as we draw breath. The word repentance is not a word of shame or worldly sorrow or to make us feel bad about ourselves, but it's to be called to have a new mind about things, to orient our lives in the right ways, to put God at the center of our lives, and to do this not just once, but over and over again, as we slowly are conformed and shaped into the image of Christ, to be truly little Christ in this world. Once again, do you have a hard time living the faith that you claim to have? Well, I know that I do, but with Jesus there is always hope to turn again and again to his gracious and loving call. Amen.